on this episode of China Unscripted. China is actively trying to manipulate the American government, how the CCP used COVID to go after Falun Gong, and the Venn diagram of Epstein and organ transplants in China. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And joining us today is Levi Brody. He's the executive director of the Falun Dafa Information Center. It's an organization dedicated to ending the human rights abuses against Falun Gong in China. Levi, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, guys. So, you know, I'm constantly amazed, uh, you know, by the Chinese Communist Party accusing others of doing exactly what they do. So, you know, for instance, the Chinese Communist Party always says it doesn't interfere in the internal affairs of other countries like, you know, the United States does. But uh, why don't you tell us about this latest FBI indictment? So, yeah, these are two CCP agents that have been in the United States back and forth for many years um, going after Falun Gong and, and other groups, other distant groups. They were trying to bribe what they thought was an IRS official to, in their words, topple Falun Gong, what that practically meant is trying to revoke the nonprofit status of one of the Falun Gong started organizations. They, they list that just as sort of entity one in the indictment, but given where the indictment was, we're pretty sure that's Shen Yun. So they were trying to bribe an official to weaponize IRS to go after Shen Yun Performing Arts. All right. Uh just in case anyone watching has not seen the, you know, 10 million billboards plastered around everywhere, uh, what is Shen Yun? So Shen Yun Performing Arts is the world's premier classical Chinese dance and music company. Every year they tour the world, showcasing authentic Chinese culture in the form of classical Chinese dance and music. Their existence, their their mission to revive authentic traditional Chinese culture is something the CCP doesn't like because it reveals, first of all, that the CCP has been trying to destroy that culture for decades, but it also reveals the idea that the CCP is a fraud in its attempt to be the shepherd of the Chinese nation, the Chinese culture, by showing actually this is what Chinese culture really, really is and the CCP, CCP has been trying to destroy it for decades. So the CCP does not like Shen Yun at all. So Shen Yun on its website says it was founded by Falun Gong members, something like that. And that's true. I mean, um, when the persecution happened in China, um, one of the things you saw was sort of a brain drain. Uh, the best and the brightest in the arts and science that happened to be Falun Gong practitioners were leaving China, much like Einstein, his compatri compatriots sort of left Germany in the 30s when things were not looking so good for the Jewish community there. So a lot of Falun Gong came out of China, and among them were some of the elite choreographers, dancers, and really Chinese cultural historians and, and sort of cultural experts. And they came together in New York, and uh, a few of them formed Shen Yun. And so the idea was that uh, these, I guess, Chinese agents, is that what is that? I don't know if that's the correct way to refer to them, but they were trying to bribe the IRS to remove what we what you're speculating is Shen Yun's tax exempt uh, status. Exactly, exactly. So they were um, and they were very sort of explicit. I mean, it, it looks like um, the FBI had access to their actual phone calls and the communications they were going through. So they were very explicit that they are getting money from their handlers back in China and they have more funds coming and they want this. What they thought was an IRS official turns out to be an undercover FBI agent. Uh, they wanted this agent to sort of go after this IRS, what they, again, what they thought was an IRS official, to go after Shen Yun in this manner. That's what they were essentially paying him for. And it, and it went on for a few meetings and a few phone calls. They actually did hand over cold hard cash to this guy and promised more. Um, and they're very clear about, oh, I got to go back to my guy in Tianjin. Tianjin is the city in China that I guess is, it was coordinating this operation from the CCP's perspective. What makes this interesting is these two guys are the first people in history to intentionally want to give the IRS money. <laughs> yeah, with with a certain motivation, sure. Right. Well, so what is the significance of Tianjin? So, you know, it's it's Tianjin is is 
significant on a couple of reasons, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is it is one of many. It's certainly not the only one, but it's one of many sort of uh, headquarters or coordination facilities for going after Falun Gong overseas, um, particularly in the New York area. And some of this stuff we're sort of having to, you know, to sort of comb through some of the CCP leaked documents and look at some of the speeches given by CCP sort of officials to kind of piece all this stuff together. But Tianjin itself seems to be somewhat of a hub on going after Falun Gong in the New York area. I mean, they have other cities that are responsible for other countries, Canada, Spain, and so on. Uh, but Tianjin seems to be a bit of a concentration for going after uh, Falun Gong in, in, in the United States, and particularly in New York. And that's something actually that was cited several times in the indictment that the DOJ brought against these two individuals, that they kept talking about, oh, my man in, in Tianjin, my, my handler in Tianjin. So it was very clear that that city was coordinating this operation. And we've seen that with other kind of operations targeting us over the last 24 years. I mean, it's it's an incredible story. Like effectively, the Chinese Communist Party is trying to manipulate the U.S. government to aid in its persecution of Falun Gong in the United States. Yes and no. I mean, it's meaning it's it's sort of extraordinary because these guys would have the audacity to try and bribe an IRS official. That seems a little out there. What is completely normal for the CCP is trying to effectively turn American officials against Falun Gong. And this dates back, I mean, this goes back all the way to 1999. I mean, the last APEC meeting where then President Clinton were was together with Jen Zemin, who's the CCP leader that launched this whole persecution. The very first thing they did in their meeting during that the, during APEC was Jen Zemin handed him a big old stack of propaganda trying to justify the persecution of Falun Gong. And, you know, the last 24 years, they've CCP officials, their proxies, sometimes thugs, have gone after our mayors, our senators, state legislatures, governors, um, national security advisor in the case of Condoleezza Rice. So this is very much normal uh, for the CCP is trying to get U.S. officials to turn against Falun Gong or at least shut up, not say anything. Don't support the, the Falun Gong practice. Certainly don't speak out against the persecution. This has been going on constantly. Do you think that's been effective? Uh, I do. I do. Um, I, it has been somewhat effective, I'll say, and because and, I think we see cases across the spectrum. Like on one end of the spectrum, we have state legislatures. We had a mayor in Santee, California, who's just outside of San Diego, who got the you know requisite letter, as, as most mayors do, from the nearby consulate saying, don't support Falun Gong, don't speak out on the persecution. And he held a press conference, says, you got to be kidding me. You can't tell me what to do in my country. Um, I'm going to support Falun Gong all the more <laughs> that you've done this. So you've got that end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, yeah, we see a lot of officials that are oddly quiet, people that would otherwise be vocal on human rights issues, be vocal on China issues, um, not speak about Falun Gong, be quiet about it, avoid meetings. So unfortunately, you know, we, we, we see all kinds of different reactions to this. And a lot of it may depend on how much leverage the CCP has over that particular individual, that city, that state, and, and what have you. I guess in a lot of ways, this does remind me of the the recent news about the secret Chinese police stations uh, the CCP set up all over the world, including in New York City. And the, just just how the Chinese Communist Party is is actively trying to silence uh, criticism of the Communist Party, even in the United States. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the CCP even surprises us at this point. Uh, the audacity to try and open up police stations and kind of kind of sell it to the world like they're just sort of this service center for the Chinese diaspora, uh, which I, I, you know, sounds like what they were trying to do. Um, but even if you look at those two arrests, so that was, what, uh, five weeks ago, six weeks ago, if you look inside the indictment, one of those individuals, some of the stuff that was listing in the indictment was anti-Falun Gong activity here in the United States. So, for example, one of the guys was busing, it was paying and busing in Chinese people, we think probably students over to D.C. to launch a counter-protest against Falun Gong to drown out Falun Gong when they were there for a peaceful demonstration. Um, the indictment also talked about the guy being asked to create 
and get published negative news about Falun Gong right here in America. So this, there are elements of that indictment that were similar to the one that, that just happened uh, involving the IRS. I mean, is it illegal to bus people to be in a protest? Um, I don't necessarily know if it's illegal to bust them or maybe not even illegal to pay them. Um, perhaps there is a FARA issue here. Um, clearly, they're acting as an agent of, the, of a foreign government. And so did they register that activity? Did the people that were bussed in and were paid by CCP proxies to sort of counter a, a, a peaceful protest here in America? Did, would they have to register? I mean, I think these are sort of the questions we, should, the, the State Department and others should, should start be looking at is, is clearly our, the, this, our civil society and our laws were not created so that a hostile foreign regime can silence American voices. So where and if they crossed legal lines, um, it's a little hard to tell, but clearly there was something wrong with that behavior because they did put it in the indictment. So maybe it's more of a foreign agent declaration issue. Now, you mentioned um, they were busing probably Chinese students. Um, I know the Falun Dafa Information Center recently released a report on how the CCP is extending its reach into American universities. Uh, can you can you tell us about that? Report? Yeah, you know, it was interesting. That started, we, we got a phone call from um, one of our friend's daughter who's at Amherst uh, College. And you know, she was uh, she was taking a Chinese language or culture class, and she was looking through one of the textbooks there. And like textbooks inside China, um, it had sort of uh, examples, uh, language examples, I guess, um, that were denigrating or vilifying Falun Gong, which is really bizarre. It's the kind of thing you see in China. You certainly don't see that outside of China. But there it was in a textbook in, in a very prominent college. And we had a discussion with her, and, and she actually had a very productive discussion with her professor and, and sort of, you know, why that wasn't, you know, why that was wrong. But it spurred a larger conversation among people who practice Falun Gong in universities across the country. And for this report that you're talking about, Chris, what we essentially eventually did is we did a survey across all these universities to see, okay, do people feel safe? Or do people feel the concrete... Uh, examples or manifestations of the CCP propaganda or the bullying or the surveillance on camp? And if, if so, what, what, you know, what does that, how does that manifest? What does that look like? And the answers were, unfortunately, um, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of people who've tried to set up Falun Gong clubs at their universities, then found resistance. Um, there's a lot of people who get surveilled by Chinese students, uh, who get bullied by Chinese students. Um, and so we felt that was important. That was an important aspect of, of this larger umbrella of transnational repression. Um, and so we put together a report that kind of documents this and shows uh, the different ways it manifests and gives some recommendations about what the, what the schools could do to, to rein this in. I think one other interesting side of that is the Chinese students who've come to study in the United States. Like most of them are probably not particularly interested in politics and don't care about Falun Gong one way or the other. But there may be a lot of pressure on them by CCP entities to get on a bus and join some kind of counter protest. And that is a bit of speculation, but it, it reminds me of how in Canada, there, uh, the CCP was pressuring overseas Chinese students to vote in the Liberal Party primaries for the CCP candidates that they wanted. Uh, because the party elections in Canada are um, anyone can vote. You don't have to be a citizen. Uh, so the like, imagine you're you're coming to like a university in another country and then someone from your own government basically comes and tells you, like, you have to vote for this person or you have to get on a bus and be involved in this protest about this issue that you don't care about or maybe even feel strongly about on the opposite side. And yet, if you don't go, uh, it's going to reflect badly on you. Not just that. They, they, I think in the Canada case, they were specifically threatening to uh, withdraw the student visas. Yeah. So you can just imagine the pressure on these, like mostly innocent, like sure, there are some that are probably involved in, you know, a little bit of spying or reporting. But like for the most part, these are just like innocent kids who've come to, you know, study in the United States. Mm -hmm. And now they're like, wait, what? I have to go to this protest. That's not what I'm here for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know. 
I think um, we were we were meeting with a few folks down in D.C. about four months ago related to the State Department. And and, and one of the things that uh, one of the folks told us there, and I think it was it was sort of a nice, honest admission, is that we, not just the State Department, but everybody, all of Western governments are about 10 to 15 years behind on catching, on understanding the extent to which the CCP could at any moment leverage pressure on an individual, whether it's a student or someone working in a company here or an entire corporation or the so-called NGO. The idea that, 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 that a nation has, or government, in the case of the Chinese government of the CCP, has the ability to weaponize any individual organization based in their country, whether it's a company engine or what have you. And what, what does that mean? It means that they could essentially turn any of these folks to be agents to do what they're, they're bidding. And I think what you, what you guys are talking about is just one sliver of this, and that is the students. And I think, Matt, I think you're very, you're right on, you're very right on that, is that that's my sense. A lot of these students, they're just students. They want to get here. They want to get a good education, maybe go back to China, get a job, maybe stay here, what have you. But they all have friends and family back in China. They have other interests back in China. They have their visas that, that they need the, the local consular embassy to support. And if they do anything that crosses the CCP, they could lose that or their family could be in jeopardy. And we see many individual cases of that actually happening. And so, yeah, it's it's a staggering problem in its complexity and sort of the different layers where we have, you know, a relatively open society, a civil society, and yet anything that the CCP that can control and they control a great deal could be turned against us. And these poor kids um, are often caught in the crossfire. I mean, I, I really feel for them because I personally can't stand being told what to do by somebody else, whether it's like a professor or a university dean or something. And like, let alone by like, your government that you're not even in that country. You you would not have made it in a communist country, Matt. Oh no, I, I would I would definitely have been killed a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, and I and I think also, and you see this a lot across the board, it's gone underground to a certain extent. I mean, I remember 20 years ago, we had an incident in a university in New York, and that the persecution had just started. And you go to the website of the university, and it's very clear they list officials with the local Chinese consulate as the board members of the student association at the university. It's very explicit. It's very clear. The consulate is running the student organization. And so the Chinese students and scholar associations. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, this is, this is a Columbia university. I, as I recall, that's what you're referring was, to, right? It was, it was. And so it was very explicit and it was very, you know, everybody understood that was going on. You don't see that anymore. That's kind of gone underground, but the behaviors are there. The patterns are there. If you talk to the individuals who and, and they and they will speak freely, all those pressures are still in place. It's just they've learned to not put that, you know, blazingly on a website. And it's still very much going on. Now, this may actually interest you, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, I gave a, a speech at Columbia University and uh sort of there's been this sea change in the in the Chinese student community there, where after the uh, the COVID protests at the end of last year, the you know the it's called the white paper protests. Uh, for a lot of Chinese students abroad, that really was kind of a wake up moment where um, they are kind of actively turning against the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, you know, I would not have been able to uh, just come and give a talk there at Columbia University, you know, twenty years ago. Um, but yeah, there was there's just an entirely different level of support for uh, critical voices of the Chinese Communist Party. So I think that's pretty encouraging, the change that's happened. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, 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 we noticed a good deal. I think you're, you're right. Um, and I think COVID was a significant trigger on that. I mean, um, there's always been, I think, a pocket of students here that have spent some time here and, and, and realized, okay, a lot of what they told growing up <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, as my grandfather would say, hogwash. Um, but yeah, I think COVID was a wake-up call. And you saw sort of the white paper protests, right? Even in American university campuses, you know, two years ago. And so um, that is that is encouraging. And yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of Chinese people who are like in their 50s who came here in the 80s to study. And then 
after the Tiananmen Square protests, they ended up staying because uh, the the president had given uh, this executive order to allow people to to stay uh, and not have to go back to China. And so there's like that was the wake up call for that generation, right? But there wasn't that many uh, Chinese people in the U.S. at that time. Like if we talked to a lot of those people, they're like, "Yeah, I stayed because of Tiananmen." And then now you have like this this new and much larger group. I think that's having their own, like 30 years later, uh, very different. Uh, well, there were reasons, lots of Chinese a people in the country before that. Um, but that was mainly a lot of people who fled like Southern China and stuff, uh, fleeing the CCP when it was beginning to come in power. Oh, no, sorry. I meant the people who came in the 80s to get their like PhDs and stuff. Gotcha. That was a smaller group. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, it's, you know, speaking of COVID, I, uh, I think it was in, in, uh, that Fondoff Information Center report, but it seemed like COVID was actually a trigger for even greater suppression of Falun Gong in China and abroad. What happened there? So, um, all right. So this is this is an important topic. Um, the The broader story is that the persecution of Falun Gong. One of the ways I think of it is gone through three phases. The it, in terms of how the CCP has suppressed information. The first was just to convince, justify, to justify the persecution to everybody. Once the level of atrocities had sort of started to gather, uh, build up, organ harvesting, large scale torture, uh, sexual abuse, death from torture, it became a cover up. And that's sort of right in the 2002, 2003 area where they went rather suddenly from a very overt kind of cultural style, cultural revolution style campaign to total silence. Everything went underground. Um, and then it became sort of like, we got to cover this up. We can't let the world see this. What happened short, what started about then has been going on f up until today. And so that's sort of the last 15, 16, 17 years is what we would call the largest or what is the largest civil dis dis disobedience movement in the world inside China. And that is literally tens of millions of Falun Gong practitioners running their own underground media, essentially, creating leaflets and, and pamphlets and under cover of night, putting them on doorsteps across China, small villages, big cities, everywhere. And so in many ways, the, the Falun Gong has become sort of this grassroots movement for exposing the CCP. And so Anytime something bad happens, like let's say hypothetically the CCP is covering up the real story of COVID, the first group they're going to go after is the Falun Gong community because that network of, of individuals, that grassroots network in China, has become very proficient in getting information out of China and also getting reports from around the world into these leaflets and into the front doors of people all throughout in China. So what you saw in COVID, and you see this in other sort of sensitive times, is that they really went after Falun Gong in order to silence that network so people aren't being told what's really going on with COVID. I think Feng Bing is the, uh, the example, one of the clear examples where he was in Wuhan and he was sort of taking videos of, of all the people that were dying and being cremated and he's sort of sending them out to the world. Well, he's a Falun Gong practitioner. And they were quite worried about that kind of thing. And so COVID is one of the things that made um, suppression and sort of the roundup of Falun Gong uh, increase a great deal. So one interesting thing about that is it's essentially sounds like the Communist Party pushed Falun Gong into being sort of political against the CCP uh, in a way that wouldn't have happened if the CCP just left Falun Gong alone. For sure. Um, I, I think th th what actually happened, I, I think that that's generally the correct characterization. I, mean, I think the way that unfolded is that in the early years of the persecution, there was this, there was this movement to just tell the people in China what was happening to them. And so if someone was beaten to death or tortured to death in a labor camp, people would go out into that village or that town and say, this is what happened. This is who did it. And they'd try and explain it to the people. But they were hitting a brick wall. And that brick wall was that, I think, throughout the Falun Gong community in China and even outside China, we realized that, that people just weren't going to listen. They were so indoctrinated with the CCP that, that, you know, yeah, the CCP might have done some bad stuff, but they were so indoctrinated. They just weren't going to listen. And I think 
learning that lesson, a lot of the people in China said, okay, if we're going to get this message across and tell people what's really happening to us, I guess we have to first tell people the truth about the CCP. And so they'll get the idea that everything they've been told is not necessarily correct. And that's that's what really started, with at least within the Falun Gong community, this idea that, hey, we're going to talk about the CCP more broadly. We're going to talk about its real history, all the violent campaigns it's, it's unleashed on the Chinese people, all these things that the Chinese people themselves have never learned about. We're going to tell you that because that's the thing that's blocking people from understanding what's happening to us, the Falun Gong communities and the, the persecution. So that's sort of really what happened, and that's what sort of um, uh, morphed essentially a persecuted group into this huge movement of civil disobedience to really expose the CCP more broadly. So I guess kind of like what Shen Yun is doing uh, kind of came out of that idea about telling people about what China is and isn't? Sort of, yeah, I, th- I think so. I mean, I think, I think there was a real... Um, I think there was a real recognition, certainly within the Falun Gong community, but probably beyond that, is that, I mean, for decades, the CCP has been trying to destroy Chinese culture, which is a very spiritual culture, um, entirely, right? So they can impose Marxism on the people. So that's been going on for decades. And I, th- I think when when they went after Falun Gong, in some ways, that was sort of the final nail, nail in the coffin to obliterate authentic Chinese culture entirely. And so I think for the artists that started Shen Yun, they're looking at this from a cultural, uh, a, a cultural perspective, a sort of a history and language perspective and going, we are about to witness the complete destruction, the final eradication of authentic Chinese culture. Something has been on this earth for 5,000 years. We can't let that happen. And so they really started Shen Yun to say, this is a very beautiful culture. It's profound. It's spiritual. We really need to, first of all, restore this, revive it so it's not lost on the face of the earth. But then let's share that with the world in a beautiful way. And so that's what Shen Yun, they really came at it from a cultural perspective and and wanting to not let the Chinese culture die. Well, this really is beginning to paint a picture of why the Chinese Communist Party treats Falun Gong so differently from any other persecuted group in China, like, like the Uyghurs, for instance. The CCP is, is, you know, has concentration camps. They're committing ethnic cleansing on them. But uh, in official state narratives, they'll, you know, trot out some alleged Uyghur in traditional garb, show kids seeing, hey, look, we're not persecuting them. We love their culture, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they do that kind of too with Tibetans, um, just kind of like this corpse of a culture they drag out to try and convince people that there is no persecution going on. But there's not even an attempt with that of Falun Gong. It seems like they just try and like bury that as much as possible. Yeah, I think I think in the minds of the CCP, Falun Gong is the third rail. It is the existential threat because um, I mean, I mean, if you just look at what's happened, I mean, it's it's sad and unfortunate, but the what's happened to the Uyghurs has been on the cover of the New York Times many, many times. Our government, the U.S. government, has officially declared that a genocide. Has it really had a material effect? If you look at all the big banks and all the big businesses and everything that's doing business with China, has there been a material impact on that? Sadly, no. And I think the CCP knows that. They certainly don't want to air their dirty laundry, but it's not an existential threat. With Falun Gong... They went after Heartland China. They went after a group that was 100 million people. It was everywhere in China. And it now is the voice, one of the leading voices for sort of exposing the CCP's dirty laundry on the world stage. And so I think when they look at Falun Gong, they see existential threat. When they look at other groups, they see nuisances. They see things they don't want necessarily to be seen, but it's not necessarily an existential threat. And I think that's sort of the big difference. And that's uh, going back to what you just said, Chris. That's why there's no even attempt to sort of say, oh, we like Falun Gong or this or that. It's, you know, you mentioned Falun Gong in a meeting with a Chinese official. That ends the meeting, period, hard stop. Um, And it's been that way for 20 years. So uh, and I think that's the reason why they see it as the existential threat to their regime. It's interesting you described uh, Falun Gong as sort of the heartland of China because – 
you know, I know before the persecution began, official numbers put it at like 100 million people practicing. Uh, but how do you get, if it was really was the heartland, how do you, how does the CCP succeed in turning public sentiment against them? Um, well, I, I think there's two things. Um, I think there's, you know, part of it is people have been through so many campaigns, whether it's the, you know, the five anti campaign or the cultural revolution. I mean, there's all this, been these violent campaigns that have really been the the main characteristic of CCP rule since 1949. The kind and, of movements that would have uh, gotten Matt purged at some point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Matt would be... At, at every point. At every point, I would be gone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So <laughs> these campaigns did a few things. One, they eliminated... Uh, what what the CCP saw as challenges to their authority, challenges to their sort of, um, you know, uh, hold on power. But it also had the effect of terrifying people because once they see all the uh, campaign after campaign, the minute a new campaign comes up, everybody does this. They go into self-preservation mode because they know people are going to get killed and slaughtered and 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 all kinds of terrible things are going to happen. And so when the persecution of Falun Gong first started, you saw that in the Chinese community was like, oh, we've seen this before. Here's another campaign. And so you have a lot of people that it's just plain fear. They've seen the terrible things that have happened to all these other groups. And they know if they don't, if they say anything, if they speak out, if they advocate for Falun Gong, they could be next. And that creates a great deal of fear. Um, so I think that's one of the one of the ways that this was, they were able to do this. The second way is, is um, I think we might have mentioned this on your show last time, is the 610 office, which is what human rights groups called the Gestapo for Falun Gong. Um, what Jun Zemin did is he, looking at the uh, across China, he saw how popular Falun Gong was and said, I can't use the rank and file of my normal police or security apparatus. I've got to create something separate beyond the law that reports directly to me and the Politburo. And that's what's going to go out and ferret out the Falun Gong people, get them into labor camps, get them into brainwashing centers. And, and that's what he did. And so that 610 office has really been running the show when it comes to persecuting Falun Gong. So I think those two things at play is really what enabled um, Jun Zemin to take something that was heartland Chinese, something that was really respected and beloved by a lot of Chinese people, and, and turn it into a persecution. It also helped the CCP get really good at persecuting people. Oh, they already had those skills in place well before. But no, actually, I get what you're saying, because like a lot of the things the Chinese Communist Party did to Falun Gong, they did to the Uyghurs, particularly organ harvesting, mm -hmm. and then they eventually used against all of China during the zero COVID. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we saw... We saw, I mean, again, the CCP didn't invent torture, um, but certainly some of the methods for, I mean, the reason a lot of the torture that happened against Falun Gong is to break their will, right? To get them to give up their faith. And so the, there's particular torture methods that were more effective than others. And they would train, literally train other labor camps on which ones are more effective. And lo and behold, you see those popping up at the Uyghur camps and other places. So it is very much a training ground for these kind of things. And and I think one of the things you were just alluding to, Chris, is, is, is the surveillance technology. I mean, they first architected the early versions of the Great Firewall, um, and some of the surveillance was built uh, to surveil and capture Falun Gong. And of course, now it's, it's unleashed not just on all of Chinese society, but really around the world. And also to prevent them from getting messages out of China, kind of like what they were trying to do in COVID. Yep, very much so. Very much. Yeah. Speaking of, of COVID, you know, you mentioned this is like um, they've been using COVID as like a third stage of persecution of Falun Gong. Um, what are some ways that they've sort of taken COVID rules or COVID technology and use that as either an excuse or a tool to specifically go after Falun Gong? Well, yeah, I mean, I think COVID was sort of a, a part of that larger third stage, which is really silencing the Falun Gong community because they knew too much and they were saying it too loudly on the world stage. And so COVID became this the primary example of something they needed to keep under wraps. And so they needed to silence the Falun Gong community, among others, uh, to do that. Um, and so one of the things they did is 
ironically, it was called zero, zero out campaign. And this actually started a little bit before COVID, but they would, they, this is sort of a, to breathe new life in the Falun Gong persecution campaign. The goal was to, to basically eliminate all the Falun Gong in your precinct, whatever you're in charge of, your city, your village, not necessarily by hauling them all off to a labor camp, but sort of, you know, breaking down their door in the middle of dinner, harassing them, telling them you're going to fire from their job, they're going to be put on a blacklist. Uh, these kind of techniques we started to see a lot, and that's exactly what they did. I mean, we could see literally the footage uh, on COVID um, when they would sort of go after people that, you know, I don't know, the, the testing results or tracing results or what have you, but they were using those exact same techniques to go after people during the COVID lockdowns. This is interesting because, uh, you know, recently Jiang Zemin, the former leader of China who started the persecution, he died. Uh, and sort of since Xi Jinping came to power, he's been in this power struggle with Jiang Zemin and a political faction tied to him. He's sort of been dismantling their power base. But it seems like, you know, even with Jiang Zemin dead, the persecution is still continuing. Yeah, I mean, I think discerning the political maneuverings of the CCP is is an enigma wrapped in witchcraft um, in terms of the complexity of who's on whose side and who's who's backstabbing someone today and backstabbing someone different tomorrow. The factional definitions and the allegiances are complicated. We certainly don't understand all of them. Um, but one of the things we know for sure is John Zimmerman's faction was for for a long time quite powerful. He elevated, I think, he elevated more generals in a year or two than his his in, the entire term of his predecessor. I mean, he put together. Uh, it was interesting. Um, the senior researcher over at Freedom House, uh, her name's Sarah Cook. She describes it as basically a mafia, and that is. You elevate people based on their ability to go out and commit horrendous crimes. That's how you rise through the ranks. And you mean the generals how, weren't being promoted for all the wars China was successfully fighting? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so that was sort of they were building up these the Jensen faction was being built on its uh, its willingness get blood on their hands. And and once you've done that, I, I would imagine, you know, you take off the original leader, John Zemin, you still have all these people that he elevated that were the drivers of the persecution that have tremendous amount of blood on their hands. And that is going to be a certain impetus to keep the persecution going, certainly try and keep the lids on, the lid on it so that the details of everything they've done don't come out. And I think that's because of the culpability of that group and that huge faction um, that's what's really driving things today. Well, I guess I would imagine even uh, people not in that political faction necessarily, since Falun Gong is such an existential threat to the Chinese Communist Party as a whole, they really can't be like, hey, whoopsie, sorry about that. Uh, Didn't mean it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's no way to back down. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's right. And I think that really happened, you know, we were going back to sort of these three stages, the first one was justification. The second one was cover up. Once the amount of atrocities got to a certain point, it was sort of like, we got to cover this up because if this gets out, we all go down. Well, maybe if you just keep doing more atrocities, eventually it'll go away. <laughs> let, let, let's hope not. Well, I mean, the, well, I mean, let's hope so, right? Well, let, let's, let's hope <laughs> well, that no, they don't we, we don't want it to stop because they have successfully atrocityed everyone to death. I see. <laughs> okay, that's yes. that's the distinction. But no, this 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 ties back into what we were saying at the beginning. Like the effects of this persecution in China are being felt here in the United States, where you know our own government is to a greater or lesser degree being controlled by the Chinese Communist Party to silence voices. Uh, persecute people, students, Chinese students at school, uh, which affects every student at a school. So this is having a real impact in the United States. For for sure, for sure. And I think, yeah, I mean, I, I would... I would venture to say it's it's reasonable to, that 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 sort of culpability sort of vortex that Jen Zeman created doesn't entirely stop at China's border. Um, um, 
in terms of the influence that he had around the world? Did he pull others into that? I'm sure there are cases of that. And so, yeah, I think that that sort of the, the blood on the hands phenomenon is to some extent felt around the world. Well, I think the CCP just feels like they, they can do it around the world and that they're like, if you look at the way the national, the Hong Kong national security law was written, the one that got passed in 2020 to stop those protests. Mm -hmm. One of the things I find fascinating about that is that it, the jurisdiction is not limited to Hong Kong or China. Mm -hmm. It's global jurisdiction. So if you commit a national security crime anywhere in the world, uh, they consider that under their jurisdiction and they can't arrest you in America. But if you go to China, they could arrest you or Hong Kong, they could arrest you. Mm -hmm. So to me, like it's that mentality of global jurisdiction that is revealed in the Hong Kong national security law uh, that kind of like when, when you look at this, this DOJ uh, indictment right against these two guys who were basically acting like foreign agents, but the CCP feels justified in doing that, like almost like legally or morally justified in their their global jurisdiction. Yeah, I, I think um, there's been sort of a, a slow, I don't want to call it a waking up, but there's been, I think the CCP has been caught unawares at various stages of this whole thing. Um, I remember when the persecution first started, um, they brought a senior official, like three days, three days, four days after the persecution started, they got a senior official on Ted Koppel's nightline. And they asked him point blank, why are you doing this to Falun Gong? At that point, you know, tens of thousands of people were being rounded up around the country. And he was sort of like, uh, they're disturbing social order and disrupting traffic. And Ted Koppel was like, what? <laughs> um, that's the best you could do? And so they weren't, I don't think they were used to the idea that they'd have to explain themselves to the international community. community. And this sort of, this, there were several stages of this. Um, years after, Several years after that, suddenly their officials are starting to be served with papers being sued in international jurisdiction courts for their crimes against Falun Gong. That was a big wake-up call. And so I think, um, I think you're right. There is a mentality in the CCP that they can kind of do what they want, such as bribe an IRS official. Um, and they're getting, um, they're getting some pushback from civilized society that says, uh, no, you can't do that. I mean, I get why they think that, uh, you know, consider that after the Tiananmen Square massacre that same month, the Bush administration sent a secret delegation to China to assure Chinese leaders that it wasn't going to get in the way of doing business with China. Yeah. So they yeah. have every reason to believe they can have global jurisdiction and that the U.S. won't fight back. Yep. Yep. And I think that was why. Yeah. I mean, coming back to the the, you know, Going back to the Uyghur question, you know, after the U.S. government has officially designated as a genocide, if you go to any major bank, U.S. bank, they still have their web page on China boasting about all the business that they're doing in China, business as usual. And I think to a certain extent, the CCP understands that and knows that. So unfortunately, um, that, you know, contrary to what I said earlier, I think there is a good amount of examples where they're not getting the pushback. And so they still have that attitude. Why do you think uh, the persecution of Falun Gong hasn't been labeled a genocide? I think it has to do with the CCP's perception of Falun Gong as an existential threat and therefore the extent to which they have gone to pressure foreign governments not to do such a thing. But also, I think we can't minimize the amount of work they've done to silence it in Western press, or in some cases, even sort of inject their narrative into some of the Western press, which makes the Falun Gong issue in the eyes of policymakers and decision makers in the West not seem like that big of a deal. I haven't read about it. hasn't been in the headlines. So what, 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 is it, what do you mean call it a genocide? I think they've been rather unfortunately effective at keeping the news of exactly the scope and scale of what happens to Falun Gong out of the news. And that means people are not as informed and not as motivated um, to do that kind of thing. It's been, it's been somewhat effective. I think I, I, I read in the media that all Falun Gong are far-right Trump supporters. Yes, or 
anarchists or, you know, yeah. I mean, there's been all kinds of stuff. I mean, those are, those are two like pretty separate ends of the exactly. spectrum, right? <laughs> exactly. I mean, I read in the paper, you know, this is interesting. I read in the paper that, uh, that actually Falun Gong, I didn't know this, were racist. Um, we don't allow interracial marriage. And so, I, you know, I was reading that and I turned to my wife, who's of a different race. And I said, honey, I, I don't know if we're allowed to be married because we both practice Falun Gong and we're not of the same race. So, um, yeah, that was another thing I had learned recently. It's always good to believe everything you read in the papers. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, so this, I mean, this kind of ties into everything, but like, I would sure love to get a list of all the influential businessmen, politicians, media moguls that may have had organ transplants in China. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's certainly, uh, several pieces of information that we've gotten that, many of the senior CCP officials have certainly done it. Um, and they're, they're, they're getting their organs from the forced organ harvesting business that's going on in China. And yeah, there's probably, I, I would, I would be scared to, to guess at the amount of foreign folks with power of some sort um, that have gone to China and benefited from them killing people for their organs. I mean, in China, you can schedule an organ transplant like two weeks from now. That's impossible yeah. anywhere else in the world. And if you were, you know, a powerful government official or a billionaire and you needed an organ, would you? why would you wait for, you know, uh, the American donation system where you might have to wait a couple of years? And possibly die while you're waiting. Yeah. yeah. Or schedule it in China. Mm. Maybe don't in ask any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's created. I mean, it's that's one clear example of a broader pattern where the CCP has done something that really has this grotesque, disgusting shadow over the world. I mean, by creating a system where if anybody is about to die and you've got enough money or power or both, you can come here, we'll kill some from for you and we'll give you their organ in two weeks. What kind of temptation, what kind of sort of moral uh, um, standard does that send out to the world to, to, to have that available, uh, to tempt the entire world with that kind of thing. And they do it in other sectors too. Forced organ harvesting is just one of the more grotesque examples. Yeah. People who have had organs transplants in China and people who went to Epstein islands. Those are the, the two lists I would really like to get someday. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, and that Venn diagram. That's oh, no, oh. The, the list in the middle there. Right? Yeah. There might be a significant yeah. overlap. It's that that's sort of the the, the moral area that the, we're, we're we're talking about here. Yeah. Well, so what is is there any kind of movement being done to counteract uh, the I mean the Chinese Communist Party's influence operations in the US or you know, it's really a covert covert war. Is there anything being done in the U.S. government to address these issues? Uh, I mean, the indictments seem to be a good step in that direction. They, they are. I mean, I think what was encouraging about these indictments is, well, first of all, that they happened. But second of all, they happened relatively quickly. I mean, you know, if you look at the sort of incidents where the first contact with this undercover FBI agent, you know, between that first contact and the time of the arrest, it was quick. It was like two and a half weeks, something like that. Um, and, and admitted, I'm sure they've been watching uh, at least the, the John Chen fellow for a while. But that was pretty quick. And the fact that they would move that, first of all, that they'd be watching them. Second of all, that they would move that quickly. That seems like an encouraging sign. Um, and again, this indictment happened just weeks after the previous one of the, the folks running the, the police stations here. So I think that's interesting. Um, who knows what, what the DAJ full, DO, DOJ fully knows and what their, what their, what their next move is. Uh, but I thought that was pretty encouraging. I also think it's encouraging that, um, you know, it's been very slow, admittedly, but these countries, and in this case, uh, states, Texas, starting to pass laws with real teeth to go after forced organ harvesting. So I think actually uh, last night or tonight, the Texas law goes into effect. Um, 
um, where they and that that's a that's a forced organ ar- harvesting law that has real teeth that prevents you know insurance insurance companies from from um, covering uh, transplants from countries where the the source of the organs are questionable and has a number n- number of other measures um, and that's sort of and you know there's there's the stop forced organ harvesting act that's going through Congress and there's been at least half a dozen other countries that have passed legislation with real teeth so again. Next to the horrific nature of this crime, way too late, way too little, but it's something and it's gaining steam. And now that we're starting to see both at the federal and the state level, things like this happening, that's also encouraging. And I think uh, we mentioned it earlier, I think a Canadian university dealing with the Chinese Students and Scholars Association, I believe at least one Canadian university actually closed uh, their CSSA when, when it became very clear that they were... Mm. working closely with the consulate. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and you know, I think over the last five years, we've seen significant numbers of Confucius Institutes being closed, um, you know, these sort of quasi-CCP-funded <laughs> extensions of our college and universities where they're supposed to be teaching culture and language, but they're really just sort of perpetuating CCP narratives. So a lot of those have closed. So yeah, I mean, if more actions could be taken against the CSSA, if we could beef up our FARA rules about who has to register and who has to all that, I mean, I think that would be another step that could be taken. Um, but it is, it is an enormous challenge. I mean, I, I can't think of another example in the history of the world where you have a government that has that much control over every company, over every individual that goes out into the world and in, including the open sort of civil societies like the United States. And you know, how do you counter that? And this is a unique problem. And um, yeah, it's good to see the government moving quickly on this latest case. And it's good to see some of this legislature starting to, to go after the forced turn and harvesting. Is there anything being done to address some of the issues in American media? Because I, I'm constantly shocked that you know the media will write certain things about Falun Gong that I know they would never say about Uyghur mm. Muslims, for instance. For instance, that's a tough that's a tough nut to crack, um, uh, especially around the you know the freedom of speech laws and you know protections that we have here. Um, I think. Purchase personally, um, I think the the FARA or something like it might be a way to go. You can't stop people, and we probably don't want to stop people from writing whatever they want or not writing some whatever they want. But boy, it would be good to know exactly who they're talking to, where they're getting money from. That should be much more transparent. And FARA or something FARA like for our media, um, I think, could go a long way when it's a lot more public and a lot more documented that if you look at a given news organization, well, what are all these people doing being wined and dined in Beijing? What's all this investment money that they're getting through if you trace it back to, you know, two or three steps? Uh, that's ten cent, Huh? Um, I think if that stuff could come to the foreground, it might shame <laughs> our media institutes on being a little bit more uh, uh, – upfront about what should be covered, what's news and what's not. Um, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I remember we did an episode about all the ways China is actively trying to influence American media, you know, inviting people over for all expense pays trips to China. Um, a lot of money being given to U S media. It's, it's really a huge issue. Yeah. 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 And, 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 you know, we we see it across the board, CCP buying up farmland, CCP buying up all kinds of assets around America. But I would certainly put buying up or doing extensive business with the media uh, near the top of that list as concerning. Well, I mean, when most of the media is owned by like one of five mega corporations or owned by individual billionaires, that's, that's very dangerous. Mm. Yeah. And that's what we, yeah, we've seen that over the last, I mean, it's gotten a lot worse over the last five years, I'd say, but yeah, that's been going on for a while. Well, Levi, thank you very much for joining us again. Um, Thank you. I feel bad about the world I live in. Thank you. (laughs) Well, at least, at least sometimes, even though we live in the world that makes us feel that way, 
it's good that you have you guys around to at least put a smile on her face a little bit while we're going through it. So I appreciate that. But who puts a smile on my face? <laughs> Not you, Matt. You don't put a smile on my face. No, I, I only put a smile on my own face when I make a joke that no one else laughs at. Right? Or gets the uh, entire continent of India mad at us. Yeah, that was funny yeah. to me. Um, but I was going to say, no, Levi, I actually feel kind of positive because the latest indictment shows that the U.S. government is at least aware and trying to do something, even if it's only a small step. It's at least a step in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. That assessment. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, Levi, if somebody wants to learn more about the Fondoff Information Center, where do they go? Uh, I'd go, go to our main website, which is felloninfo.net, which is F-A-L-U-N-I-N-F-O.net, felloninfo.net. And there we- so you've had that since like the 90s, right? The dot net? Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't that. hear too many dot nets. <laughs> yeah, we're one of the last holdouts. Um, but yeah, you can read all the latest news. We also have a bunch of special reports, and we also have an area where we've got video and document documentaries reach uh, can can watch about some of these issues. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and thank you for watching. Once again, I'm Chris Chapel, and I'm Matt Ganesta. We'll talk to you next time.